Um, so, uh, you know, Sloth, uh, Gifford, and I have been friends for a long time, and we've talked about a lot about how systemic design and mechanics and everything works together. And um, Giff and I have been tossing around some ideas behind the scenes now for almost, God, like three years. And when we saw what was going on with Titan, it really necessarily wasn't about Titan. It was about understanding the systems of where it came from and what we can utilize um, with a couple different pillars. Um, one of that is bringing fair launch to Pulse Chain. No sacrifice, none of that. Um, you're bringing your economic energy in. And with that economic energy, um, one of the other pillars is going to be permeable tokenomics, which is gift, or coined by GIF. And what it is is that you're bringing that economic energy back into the system, not just as a lifeguard, but as a overseer to make sure that it works in a very contingent way. But more importantly, the core mechanic is creation, not inflation. So Giff and I like to use the term no leaky boat. And when you use those different paradigms together, they're like scats, uh, stats on a character or something like that, that really kind of binds an ecosystem into it. And when we were kind of tossing around the idea, we were thinking about what would be interesting about binding two L1s together. So we're binding basically you know, Ethereum into Pulse Chain and then start to thread those mechanics together. And so in this particular round, we'll call it, or version, no, no expectations, all the rest of that, it's not a utility token. It's an infrastructure layer for things that would be interesting to be developed. We can just call it that because systems require fundamentals to be laid in bedrock. And we're very, very uh, passionate about doing that kind of stuff. Is that a, a good start for you, sir? Absolutely. And, uh, you know, we're really trying to innovate a couple things with Pulsar. So... A couple of things we're trying to innovate is one, um, Larry touched on it, which is the creation, not inflation. And essentially what that means is in, in order for this token to come into existence, real economic value has to go into the minting process, right? And then we need to combine it with something called, you know, no leaky boat, which means if you if you try to do this fair launch, but you do it in like a minor kind of mindset, kind of like what Titan X or Zen has done, um, you run into that problem where you have constant inflation that just keeps pulling down the price, right, of, of whatever that, that main token is. Um, so what we're doing is in order to mint a uh, Pulsar, and mind you, the only pre-mint of Pulsar we're doing is going to be locked in a liquidity pool, right? We're doing that to lock that in. Other than that, there is no founder coins. There is no VCs jumping in. There's no sacrifice. If anybody's sacrificing anything, it's the founder sacrificing for the initial pool because we have to pair that Pulsar with actual Ethereum, right? So once, once that's established, then the only way you can get Pulsar is by putting in real economic value in the form of Ethereum and Titan X in order to mint Pulsar, right? Um, so that's that's the main one. And then the second one, and we can we can pull these apart a little bit more if you guys want. But the second main thing or main innovation that we wanted to pull off was how can we kind of meet three different communities where they are and have their own narratives that all still align with one one token with Pulsar, right? So we've got the uh, the Ethereum maxis, right, who think who literally say things like, uh, and I've heard this before, that Pulse chains for the degenerates, like the de degenerate gamblers and such, right? There's, a, there's a, a big view of that on the Ethereum standpoint. So if you want to come and mint Pulsar, you can do that and never touch Pulse Chain. Totally cool. Now, let's say you come in and you're the Pulse Chain Maxi, right? And you're like, I'll never go back to Ethereum because those fees are outrageous. I, I want nothing to do with that, right? But maybe they're interested in Titan X. Maybe they're interested in Pulsar. We are going to bridge economic energy to Pulse Chain whether people who interact with our smart contract want that happening or not, or even know about it. Totally fine. In what world has that ever existed before? Every world we've been in, we've relied on whales, institutions, you name it, to actually bridge over their economic energy over to Pulse Chain. We've developed a system to make that happen automatically without anybody needing to approve it or not. And on top of that, it even um, goes into the fact that there's no OA or the rest of that. Yes, technically, the permeable token I was is the OA. Hey, Max, you want to go ahead and scroll down to the second year mark um, where it says uh, Titan X and uh, um, Pulse Chain? We can just kind of 
scroll, down scroll this back. Way. Yeah, yeah, just keep going down. Just just nice and nice and lazy data cool. Um so um yeah, and as Gifford was just saying, we don't need DOA and we're bridging and handling all the economic energy for you, which is you know, not only not been done before, um, due to how we're building it, it doesn't have any externality risk, which is the most important thing about the air quote, no admin keys, but it really is. It's just put yourself at a pure security um, point above where you don't have to worry about anything else um, cracking the boat again. Go ahead. Give yeah. So before I go any further, anybody on the panel want to ask a quick question or, or need a clarification on anything that's been, that's been talked about so far? I know it's a lot. <laughs> so, 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 so you guys, uh, obviously Titan X is over on Ethereum, right? Yep. And so obviously most of us have wallets that bounce between Ethereum and Pulse Chain through, through MetaMask and, or, or, uh, internet money wallet. And so you're going to go over on to, to Pulse, you're going to be on Ethereum and that's where you're going to put your economic energy, but it's going to show up on the Pulse Chain network. Is that correct? Sort of. You're, you're, you've got the general gist of it. Um, the technicalities of it is a user who wants Pulsar will go to our Ethereum DAP and they will mint their Pulsar and they will have to deposit the two Ethereum based tokens to do that. On And then after that, our transact your transaction with our front end is done. You got your Pulsar. We now have Titan X and wrapped Ethereum in our possession. Now, the question is, what do we do with that wrapped Ethereum and, and, and Titan X, right? Well, for one, we want to be a good steward of the Titan X community. So what we're going to do is we're going to automatically burn 50% of that Titan X that comes in, which the user gets credit for, by the way. And if you know more about the Titan X community, you'll, you'll know why that's important. And then we're also going to take the other 50%, and that's getting bridged over to Pulse Chain, right? And nobody owns that but the smart contract. And that's going to get deposited into a pool paired with, with Pulsar so that now we've got, we, we can start thickening up liquidity over on Pulse Chain. For Titan X, so people can can interact. They can maybe you know do a lottery ticket or whatever on on Titan X price at some point in the future, or maybe people want to build on Titan X over on Pulsar, right? Or over on Pulse Chain. So there's that. And then then the second question is is all right. What do we do with the Ethereum, right? So on ours, the Ethereum, we do have 10% that goes to development and Genesis holders, right? So that's a no expectation wallet. All the all the things apply with that. But 90% of that Ethereum, which is going to be the chunk of our transactions, is going straight into a trustless buy and burn smart contract that will buy up Pulsar and burn it out of existence. So the idea is here is you're going to be in a situation where a natural arbitrage is created. It's too bad we lost uh, Crypto Sloth because him and I talked a lot about this. Yeah, way more behind closed scenes than than in front of camera. But we talked a lot about this in the Icosa Hedron ecosystem and about the ceiling that was created on Ico, uh, Icosa based on um, the ratio between that and Hex, right? And the whole idea behind that was to pump the price of Hex, right? In our ecosystem, we will also have a ceiling that will be based on the value of Ethereum and the value of Titan X that goes into creating Pulsar which means that if Pulsar exceeds that ceiling, people can now take their assets, mint Pulsar, and sell it back down, potentially at a profit, right? Yeah. Uh, do you want to re re comment on Moondog's comment? It says, creating infrastructure to enable Ethereum communities to deload ETH by running cheaper parallel transactions on Pulse Chain and having value tied between, like Richie has often talked about. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, this is kind of the magic sauce, right? It's like, how do we, how do we really get this liquidity over on to Pulse Chain? Like, how do we do it? We we we've done all the right things in traditional means of like going out, networking, talking to new people, onboarding new people, getting people excited about Pulse Chain. But how do we do it in a way that um, brings over the people that just refuse to look into it, right? Mm -hmm. And this is one of those ways. And how do we add more money coming through the bridge? Everybody knows about the Pulse Chain Bridge and they know to go to goldpulse.com, right? And they can look at how much value is being bridged over. We're creating a smart contract that is permanently bridging value to Pulse Chain, permanently. 
So that's one of the very cool innovations that we're bringing at the table. Uh, right can, I, can I ask you a quick question there? So when we, on, the, on the Ethereum side, so we throw our Titanx in on our Ethereum and and we create, we mint Pulsar. Does that Pulsar automatically get sent to your wallet on the Ethereum, on the, on the Pulse chain side? Or does it sit on the Ethereum side until we send it ourselves? You only get it on the Ethereum side. You're, you're in your Ethereum wallet on the RPC of Ethereum. You're making your transaction. You get your Pulsar immediately. As far as the smart contract and you are concerned, your transaction's done. You put in your value, you got your Pulsar, you're done. Okay. Everything that happens on the backside is to benefit the ecosystem. Yeah, and Vets asked here, <clears throat> and Kool Aid answered it in the chat, but I just want to do this for the people that listen while they're jogging or at work. Uh, will there be additional bonded liquidity pairs created on Pulse Chain? Yeah, so the main bonded liquidity pair on Pulse Chain, which will be the same thing, no admin keys, it's going to be locked liquidity, will be E Pulsar, E Titan X. That's where the smart contract is going to be creating the liquidity on Pulse Chain. And then any other liquidity pools that may pop up, a lot of opportunity there. Some people may say, especially guys like Sloth, again, wish, wish he was here. Uh, <laughs> you know, wrapped Pulse in these two tokens. Um, you've got stable coins in these two co tokens. You've got all kinds of communities that love to pair their tokens with a thousand other tokens on Pulse Chain. A lot of opportunity there. Cool. And then, then that's also asked that uh, all a person does is deposit liquid Titan X. Is it that simple for the end user? That's right. Well, it's, yeah, you, you basically on the front end, put in how much liquid Titan X you want to basically do. And um, our um, front end will basically tell you how much that is in Ethereum. And it's a flat ratio. Like, again, this it's more about understanding infrastructure than using the word utility to not understand what utility is. Because you have the ability to make cheap um, swaps, DCAN, um, on Pulse Chain, whether that's Pulsar, Titan X, or any other token that you want. But then by binding both liquidity on either chain, now we're moving that frustrum forward. Um, instead of just, you know, a, a forked PRC that came from Ethereum, now we're building an infrastructure network to actually build that utility in between those two veins um, on top of each other. And then because the arbitrage is immediate, we handle all that back end stuff. Um, something that Gif said um, off uh, stream one of these times that I thought was really brilliant is because the system is actually so simple, you don't have to stake it. You don't have to lock up your tokens. You literally don't have to do everything because the system has core fundamentals on how it's created from the ground up. Um, it, it already acts as a staking token because of the price appreciation just from creation not inflation that economic energy going to fund the permable which we can get into a little bit more later um and how all those things actually wrap as a system together harmoniously so if you look at a t-share it's proof of time and if you studied zen it was proof of gas titan is proof of ethereum whether you understand the project like all the stuff or not but we have studied um you know the giants that came before us and that is why you know, Giff and I spitballed about this for a long, hot minute. And we're like, we can actually work with this to build something deeper into the ecosystem and actually set the standard besides just forking, you know, someone else's stuff that they did before. Awesome. I I'm going to throw Moondog's first uh, comment up here and second comment and ask you guys politely to um, to translate this into English. Or make I mean, it maybe maybe bring it down, bring it down a little bit so. more. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I know that Gifford is a, a gifted translator. So when he says creating infrastructure to enable Ethereum commodities to deload ETH, let's just stop there. What what is he saying? So essentially, what he's saying is, you know, this is a great opportunity to show the Ethereum communities um, what Pulse Chain can do for them, in particular the cheaper parallel transaction. So what this is doing is Pulsar and ePulsar are roughly going to have the same value, right? Just like you can see a, a wrapped Bitcoin or wrapped ETH on Pulse Chain has similar values as what's on Ethereum, mm -hmm. right? So this is going to kind of uh, tie each other together. This is basically what, what, what uh, Kool-Aid means when he's talking about binding two L1s is you're going to be able to play in two different ecosystems, um, but you're playing the same game. 
you may not know it, but you are. So it's going to give the Ethereum uh, communities a chance to offload their Ethereum and come play over on Pulse Chain. Okay, great. So like back in the day, for instance, uh, when when I was a Bitcoin maxi and we didn't want to pay the fees on the Ethereum network, we would take our Bitcoin and we'd go to Doge because Doge was super cheap and it was basically a stable coin of nothing. And so to avoid the Bitcoin fees back in the day, we used to switch it to Doge, do what we wanted to, send people money, whatnot, and then come back to Bitcoin as a store of value. So it's kind of like like um, arbitraging the the cheaper fees on Pulse Chain. Is that one way you could put it? Absolutely, I love that. I love that explanation too. And and that's kind of the key is we're playing in so many different communities. You're gonna have correct answers from two different communities looking at this from two different angles, right? So mm -hmm. there's not really a bad way to look at it. Um, if you're talking about specifically like what routes you use to like minimize the gas fees and that sort of thing. Um, that's one thing, but human nature is to find what's most convenient, right? Like people will do what's most convenient to them. So we're, we're creating a more convenient way um, to, to, to run your favorite smart contracts on Pulse Chain at a cheaper rate. That makes, okay, that makes a lot more sense. I really appreciate that. And let's tackle this one right here. Additional bonded liquidity on Pulse Chain that requires new economic, economic energy input as a part of its creation, aka filtering for quality of net creative players versus arbitrage feeders good stuff. Again, like that's English, Fantastic. but my brain has like rejected the third three <laughs> syllable words. And I'm like, I wait, what? I don't, what? One, I don't understand one freaking word. <laughs> <laughs> And I love you. I love you, Moondog. I appreciate this. So you're bringing us good information. We just need to put it in like, you know, kindergarten language for me. I got you. I think I got you. Uh, okay. So so this is great. Another great comment. So what he's talking about in particular is the requires, right? He's got an all caps requires new economic energy input in order to get the pulsar. So what's funny is, you know, this is a token that does not require you to stake it to earn yield or play any other games like wait out time or anything like that. And the reason why is because all the only way to mint it is to put in econo economic energy. So there's not really going to be too many scenarios where somebody is going to want to mint their pulsar and then immediately sell it for a loss. Right. Because that's literally what they would be doing. And the only time they'd be selling for uh, a premium is if they're waiting for the price to ratchet up over mm -hmm. time. Right. And then, even in the event that, let's say, uh, in the numbers I ran, it would require roughly 70% of, of all the economic energy used to mint Pulsar to actually dump the price of Pulsar. So, so that being said, our, our comeback on that is uh, the highest buy and burn percentage that anybody's seen yet in crypto, which is 90% of the Ethereum that comes in, which is the majority cost of minting Pulsar as it currently stands, will be used to buy and burn Pulsar and thus attempt to keep it close to its ceiling price. So it's not only buying and burning or uh, the Titan X over on um, on Ethereum, it's also lowering the amount of Pulsar on Pulse Chain. We're, we're burning. We're, we're a fan of burning. So we're burning Titan X and we are also buying and burning Pulsar um, as it's needed. Awesome. Okay, so going back to what he says here, uh, filtering for quality of net creative players versus arbitrage feeders. So he's saying that like it, you, more economic energy is going in than coming out, whereas arbitrage is like a zero sum game plus fees. So it's actually worse than a zero sum game for most people. Yeah, trying to arbitrage. And this is where the the uh, the term uh, permeable tokenomics came from. I, I racked my brain for like three months on this guy. Like I was talking to Sloth. I was talking dude, I was talking to everybody I could. And we could not come up with a name for this. But when you do a buy and burn, and it's especially prevalent in Pulse X, if you keep an eye on the amount of Pulse X is getting burnt and taken off the market, bought and burnt, um, you start to realize that buying and burning is it's very powerful, right? And there's something weird that happens in a buy and burn, you know, in a trustless way. The weird thing that happens is that you're taking somebody 
you're, it's almost like you're taking somebody who has money and they buy a token and then they walk away for the rest of their life and they never come back and look at it. Like it, that economic energy never gets touched again. It only gets touched that one time during the buy process and you'll never see it get sold. That's a very special mechanic. And the that's why I came up. I'm like, hey, this should be called perma bull tokenomics because you are a permanent bull when you have a buy and burn that supports the token that you just minted, right? So, mm -hmm. so that's that's what he's kind of touching on there too. Is is uh, there's no way to like arbitrage or like beat the system so you can dump on other people's heads. You either you either are contributing to the perma bull or you're just not contributing at all. But there is no way to gain the system to dump on everybody awesome that's in crypto says is a person depositing both titan x and eth correct so that's at the there will be a ratio on there and right now based on the the price of titan x since it has come down so much um it's going to be majority ETH. so uh, one at one point in time when we were building this one billion titan x equaled one ETH. that used to be mm -hmm. a thing but because it's come down so far, um, it's not a value of 50-50 anymore. So it's still 1 billion Titan X per 1 ETH. But the 1 ETH is, you know, worth like, what is it now? Like uh, 3,600 or something like that? Yeah. And yeah. that amount in Titan X is much, much less. Right? Yeah, but, but remember, I'll... It will bounce around. Yeah, and I think one point to notice is that remember that Titan is mined by using ETH by, by time and not to go into the pure mechanics on that. It, there's a very fundamental reason that those slip and slides or those parallels can actually equalize very quickly based on what time frame that you're looking at and what's going on um, with that mechanic. And another thing is you don't have to mint Pulsar if you don't want to. You can just go buy it off the market. But if you're not creating it, you're not adding the economic energy to the permable when we get there, which is its, its main um, overwatcher that handles all the rest of it completely and, and that's the real different thing is that again you can literally just hold this token liquid don't have to do anything else with it and the entire systems will work behind you without lending staking locking up all of that's done from the core creation process and the fundamentals that you use to create the system yeah and Fal falcon crypto says how does titan x figure into this so there's the so the biggest thing is like we could choose to use whatever token we want, right? We we could have choose different tokens. We chose Titan X because of the way of their ethos of developing um, early on. The way we we saw that and we recognized that, and we're like, okay, this might be a, a community we can we can uh, we can work with here. And that being said, we knew we had to burn Titan X, so we wanted to make that be a huge factor in the creation of Pulsar. Um, now. Here's here's one of those situations where we can talk to three different communities and, and talk from three different narratives. So here's the Titan X narrative is we want to be a good steward of Titan X. So we're requiring Titan X to come in as part of the minting process. We're burning 50 percent and we're creating liquidity for people to buy Titan X over on Pulse Chain. And now, as you say, when we when we when we bind layer ones. If everybody starts trying to get their lottery ticket on Titan X and it pumps over there, guess what? It's going to pump on Ethereum too because natural arbitrage will make sure that that happens. So we're getting a whole community exposed to Titan X while we're burning Titan X as well. Yeah, and Smoke Spider says works like a balancer. And of course, uh, Kool Aid says, yeah, the ARBs actually are the balancers. So they'll balance when something gets out of uh, one gets higher than the other. It really comes back to understanding the uh, Casa Hedron training days sessions um, that really the fundamentals of those things come into uh, play because, yeah, the market does what the market does, but humans, whether it's bot or people doing things, will do and move things to make profits. And because our ecosystem is uniquely designed to take advantage of those paradigms, it automatically works as a balancer because that's what that is using, algorithms to balance loads of tokens yeah i go going back to that that uh, icosahedron balancing uh how do how do we see that balancing out is that where where there's they're tied together at a certain ratio right 
Yeah. So early on, like before the uh, the the auctions essentially opened up, because uh, Icosa launched, and then you could immediately turn in your HSIs in order to mint Icosa, you know, trustlessly from the smart contract. Um, but when you do that, that's that puts it into the ability to go into vault and thus go on to the auction, which means that it pushed out the auctions to really getting started for 90 days. While we were in that 90 day window, we saw the uh, the Hedron or the uh, the Icosa hex ceiling really do some really cool stuff. This is this is why I bring in this into Pulsar. And what it did was is every time Icosa got bought up and it ex exceeded that ratio between basically it was outperforming hex. It gave arbitragers the opportunity to come in, buy a bunch of hex off the market, stake at Quattrocinco and then sell it to the contract for Icosa. And then they made a profit from the two. So the Icosa they received in return was worth more than the hex that they put in. And then, you know, that's how the arbitrage, that's how it keeps it, keep it at the ceiling price. And it worked really nice for, for a few weeks there at the beginning. Um, and what that did, I mean, just look at the advantages of what that did. It, it took more hex off the market and staked at Quattrocinco, right? And then mm -hmm. it gave people the opportunity to win these in the auction house later on. Fantastic idea. The, the only unfortunate part was is once the auctions went live, and I and I did mention that this was a concern of mine before the auctions actually went live, was that people would be getting huge discounts on these HSIs, and their ceiling price is not the same as everybody else's what it was at the beginning because they got these cheaper. And then they can go ahead and sell that to the contract and then sell down the price even more. And then so essentially that price load was just too much. And then not to mention, if you staked Hedron, if you staked Icosa, you earned more Icosa in the process. So that was inflation there. So there was a lot going on to battle that. So I'm thinking, how do we get that ceiling back? Because that's good for the ecosystem. It's good for, in this case, um, Titan X. Because every time, a boot, every time the price of Pulsar goes above the ceiling, People will need to buy some Titan X to pair with their Ethereum to mint Pulsar and sell it back down for a profit. So it's like, how can you make arbitragers a net benefit for the ecosystem? And, and this is how. Hopefully that answered your question fairly well. Yeah, yeah that, that makes a lot more sense. And I like the, the way you tied it back to, to Icosa. Uh, Adam mm -hmm. says, jumping off my diving board into Pulsar and Pulse Wars. Uh, go ahead. Kool -Aid. Oh, oh, just one more point. It was like, it's one of those things that you learn as you go on. I mean... I've talked about it now for years. Everything is a free simulation for me because when you actually look at something objectively, whether your bags are tied to it or not, um, you now start to think like an actual game dev. Um, we don't get to you know be like, oh, I spent all this time on something and it's broken, throw it away. And we study it and figure out why it broke, build it again and massage it. And the T rank was what got Caddy Wampus over on Titan X. The same reason that when um, you know uh, Alex gave the Hedron bonus, um, and it didn't have a buy and burn component to it at, at all. Um, what it does is it leverages your your angle in a wrong direction. And it's very hard to come back from that, um, especially when the overweight and pressure gets more and more leaning in that direction. And that's the important thing instead of forking something is to study something. Um, you can always, we always need to study what comes before us, but you need to rip it apart and really understand the components, rebuild the components, not fork a system. It's a very, very, very important thing in all walks of life and how you handle that kind of stuff. And th that's how, you know, we're looking at that approach. Awesome. At Vets and Crypto says, then ideally an end user sets an LP to exit when ready as in a way to not hurt the chart and not eat slippage. Is that correct? Well, Vets is just on it. Is he not? I, I recognize him from the, uh, from the Icosahedron days too. Yeah, I mean, you... You know, ideally, you could be in a position where you could mint um, Pulsar or buy it off the market and then set a V3 liquidity position to be able to exit later on down the road. And that's like could be seen as a as a stake or like an exit point. Right. So eventually, here's the two things you have to believe if you believe that Pulsar will go up in value. You have to believe that Ethereum is going to go up in value and you have to believe that um, Titan X is going to have to go up in value. But you don't have to believe that they both have to. And that's the important part. So if Titan X is still kind of trading sideways, maybe it goes down a little bit more. That's fine. 
what do we think Ethereum is going to be doing in this bull market? I have price targets that are very high for Ethereum, probably a lot higher than uh, most of the streamers will will would agree with me on. But if that goes up in price, now it get, gets more and more expensive to mint Pulsar. And same thing could be done in reverse. Say Ethereum starts going sideways and then all the, the math and tight necks just really starts clicking. Um, or we see a new protocol that gets other people really excited, right? And that starts shooting up. It also does the same thing. It makes Pulsar more expensive to mint. And then what happens when they both go up? Well, now it's more expensive squared to mint. And every time that, that happens, the price ceiling is going up. And it's like, wait, but how do we keep up with the price ceiling? Permable tokenomics. That's how we do that. 